the report, which has come from the Australian newspaper, essentially says that the government was preparing, or at least looking, at the possibility of pressing ahead with a Pacific Step Up 2.0, if you like. Now, this would involve not just uh, an expansion of things like uh, migration from the Pacific island countries to Australia, the expansion of labour mobility programs, but also, according to the Australian newspaper, a really big increase in foreign aid, something in the order of, uh, of almost doubling of, of foreign aid uh, towards, uh, from, from Australia to Pacific island countries. So this would have represented a really significant increase uh, in foreign aid. Now, the report also said that, uh, that essentially that this was pushed back by the government because of concerns around costs, that there wasn't going to be bang for buck and that the government couldn't, uh, couldn't countenance the expenditure. Now, several government ministers, including the Prime Minister, have been grilled about this today. None have really denied the report's accuracy. They've all said that they can't really be drawn on it because it's a matter of confidence in front of uh, Cabinet's National Security Committee. Uh, but there has also been an awful lot of speculation about exactly where this story came from. What was the source or who was the source of the leak? Now, Labor has suggested that it's proof of deep disunity in the government, implying that it must have come from a member of the National Security Committee, a very senior minister in Scott Morrison's government, uh, who seems to be intent on undermining the Prime Minister. They say it's a sign that the government is ragged. Now, the government hasn't directly pointed the finger at anyone, but Scott Morrison did say today that he was confident none of his ministers would have leaked that information. And he also observed, pretty pointedly, it has to be said, that there were also officials in NSC. So he seemed to be hinting or suggesting there that uh, officials may have been responsible for this leak, uh, though he didn't make that, uh, that uh, allegation directly. Look, whoever leaked this, and whatever the reason, it's, it's damaging for the government because it's, a, it's, a, it's an untidy development. And it also draws, on the day before the election, attention back to the Pacific, and in particular to the Solomon Islands China Security Pact uh, that, the, that was signed recently by the two countries and which Labor has uh, vociferously criticised the government over, calling it uh, a massive strategic blunder. Meanwhile, Stephen, it sounds like the Australian Federal Police have been embroiled in a political controversy. Yes, this is a, a fascinating story that has broken relatively recently. Yesterday, Matthew Wale, who's the opposition leader in Solomon Islands, put out a pretty extraordinary press release uh, alleging that the Australian Federal Police, which has a pretty substantial presence still in Honiara, of course, you remember they came in after the riots last year in, in Solomon Islands uh, to, to restore order, which they did successfully. Uh, but Matthew Wale essentially accused the AFP of paying a hugely inflated price Price for a beachfront property which it was using, uh, which he said had been rented uh, from a, an MP who's very close to Solomon Islands Prime Minister Manasseh Sokovare and who's a key power broker. Now, he didn't make any direct allegations, but the implication seemed to be that the AFP had made this move in order to somehow curry favour with this MP or, or with Manasseh Sokovare's government. Now, the AFP has responded to that today really forcefully. It hasn't said exactly how much it's paying for this, uh, for this block, but it has said that it's not going to accept the allegation that it's acted improperly, saying that any suggestion that it hasn't acted properly here, it rejects totally. And separate to that, the ABC has been told that the figure that Mr. Mr. Wale has, putting, has been putting around um, about the, uh, the rental uh, price that's allegedly been paid, he alleged it was about uh, 200,000 Solomon Islands dollars, dollars a month. Well, the ABC has been told that the real figure is only a fraction of that. So the AFP is effectively pushing back against this allegation uh, from Mr. Wale. But what it really does signal is the fact, or what, it, what it's a reminder of, is the fact that Australia has a pretty fraught relationship with many of the key players in Solomon Islands. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't have some strong relationships. Obviously, it does institutionally. But at the moment, it's in the situation where, despite those institutional links, despite the enormous efforts
efforts that Australia has gone to, to bring COVID vaccines into the country, to help with development, and of course the fact that it was an Australian force that essentially restored order last year. Despite all of that, it still has this really fraught relationship, not just with Manasseh Sogavare, the Prime Minister, who's really attacked Australia recently ferociously, but also with Mr Wale, the, the opposition leader who, who made this allegation and, and which the, the AFP has rejected outright. Um, it's a reminder of just how fraught politics is in Solomon Islands, um, how difficult it can be to navigate, uh, and the, the obstacles that Australia faces in that country when dealing with political elites. It's not easy terrain. Indeed. Well, with just a day to go until polls here in Australia close, how prominent a role has foreign policy played over the last six weeks of campaigning? Well, foreign policy has played a pretty significant role in this election. Perhaps more accurate to say that foreign policy and national security policy have played a big role uh, because, of course, the early stages in particular of the campaign were really dominated by news of this security pact. Uh, signed between China and Solomon Islands. That drew an awful lot of attention uh, and dominated uh, some of the opening weeks of the campaign. In particular, Labor really seized on that to try and disrupt the narrative that the government had been pushing, that it's very strong on the Pacific, strong on national security and strong on China, uh, arguing that for all the government's rhetoric and, and bombast, it had still presided over what it called a huge strategic blunder or a massive strategic fa uh, failure in the region with the prospect of China China securing uh, some sort of presence potentially down the track uh, in Solomon Islands. So it has, it has dominated in the early stages. Since then it's faded away a little bit. The focus from both major parties and the media has returned to what it traditionally focuses on in election campaigns, uh, in particular uh, bread and butter domestic issues, which uh, are still the ones that most, mo both major parties believe are at the core of the calculus that's in most voters' minds when they go to the polls uh, and which are the issues that are going to shift votes one way or the other. Now, what will be interesting, of course, in the wake of this election is whether those foreign policy debates come roaring back, even when we do have a new or a returned government in place. We're, uh, we're uh, of the belief that Mr Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, is going to tour not just Solomon Islands, but also several Pacific Island nations from next week. That's, that's going to be a pretty substantial tour. Now, we don't know anything about this visit for sure, but we do think it's likely that he's going to unroll a whole series of MOUs and agreements in several of these Pacific Island countries as part of this tour. This will be a very powerful reminder, whether to a Labor government or to a returned coalition government, uh, of the strength of China's presence in the region and also its ambitions. So I think that will be something that both major parties will watch very closely. Uh, and monitor, monitor with a great deal of attention back in Canberra, even as they begin the process of, in the coalition's case, resuming government, or in Labor's case, putting together a new government and trying to lay out its key foreign policy priorities.